Why do you have so many helmets out? Because this gear tasting is going to get retarded. Hey guys, welcome to Gear Tasting. Today I wanted to start off talking about helmets. So if you remember a couple of gear tastings ago, I brought up some eyewear, an iPro from 3M that I really liked. So I had these, I had a bunch of these that I was given at SHOT Show. There's like three pairs. Wait, no, those are the new ones. So there's basically three pairs of this style. So it was a three pack that I picked up at Media Day at the range. And I, I bragged about how awesome they were. I really loved them. They were super lightweight. I loved the low profile of the sides here and how well they fit um, underneath the helmet and things like that. And um, I got contacted by 3M um, to check out some of their other wares. So I'm very excited to be telling you about this stuff because I'm not just talking about it because they sent it because you know I don't do that here on gear tasting. I'm talking about it because I see a distinct benefit in these products that I want to share with you. And I'm pretty stoked about it. I've, I've been a diehard kind of Sordon fanboy since I started shooting. Um, as you guys know, I talked a little bit about converting this old pair of MSA Sordans um, to, with these arc rail adapters and these, these other little adapters from Unity Tactical and kind of what a pain it was. And, you know, I finally kind of got all this ready to go and in the proper configuration, which the microphone is still on the wrong side. But anyway, um, got it all under this configuration and I was, I'm pretty happy about it. I talked to you guys kind of in detail with the procedure that I went through to kind of make that a reality. And I'm here to tell you Peltors are, <laughs> you know, 10 times better. Um, I've been messing around with these. Uh, I love the, the communication aspect of these and how modular and versatile they are. So I, I'm kind of lost a little bit on where to start talking. There's a lot of stuff to talk about. I started off with eyewear, which we'll get into in a second. Um, kind of an upgraded 3M eyewear that they have kind of to the 600 tactical series stuff that they're doing. Uh, but this is kind of the big news, this lightweight helmet. So I want to first talk about just ballistic helmets in general and why it probably should be one of your first choices rather than plates. So you're far more likely to encounter some type of head trauma or damage from shrapnel or something like that um, in your head area than you are on your chest. So meaning that if you're, if you're really in a firefight, which most of us in the civilian world that are probably watching this video aren't going to be engaged in, um, you're more likely to, you know, pop your head up from behind cover or concealment and, you know, take a, take a round that way. So the 3M helmet that I have here is called their Lightweight Ballistic Bump, I believe is the, is the title of it. It uh, it's, doesn't have anything to do with being pregnant. It's a ballistic bump. It's a little different, right? So um, this is, I think it's the N49, I have it down, yeah, N49 Lightweight Ballistic Bump Helmet. So first off, ignore kind of the Peltors on the side here, because the helmet on its own should kind of stand on its own for what we're talking about here. So um, I was very much impressed with taking this out of the box and feeling exactly how lightweight it was. So it offers the same ballistic protection of like a um, Ops Core Fast Helmet, uh, ACH Helmet, anything like that. So it's got the same 3A level of protection for impact resistance and you know rounds and things like that. So you're not going to find any difference in the actual rating. It comes with the, the NIJ certification, all that good stuff. But the weight savings is tremendous uh, versus, I mean, even a standard ACH. I had to write down some, some weight measurements. I had Rob's help on this because I wanted to make sure I, I kind of gave you guys a real idea of what we're talking about here. So when you're, when you're talking about the, the fast bump helmet, which is this, this is just a bump helmet. There's no ballistic protection in this. So really the purpose of wearing that is that, hey, if I, you know, fall down on a rappel, if I hit my head on something, at least there, you know, I've got a brain bucket and my head's protected. So that's the deal with a bump helmet and the, the advantage of wearing one of those. Obviously, it gives you a platform, too, for running night vision and comms and things like that, too, especially with the integrated arc rails like I did with my Sordans. So non-ballistic, we're, we're talking about 10.8 ounces, so 11 ounces, creeping up on a pound, but not quite there. 
Then the ballistic helmet, so the fast ballistic helmet, so this version here from OpsCore is one pound, 14 ounces, and versus an ACH, which is three pounds, five ounces, really. That's a significant savings already. But then when you talk about the 3M lightweight ballistic bump helmet, you're now at one pound, 9.9 .9 ounces. So four, four-ish, five, almost five ounce difference between the fast ballistic and the 3M ballistic, which may not sound like a whole lot, but it is. I mean, when you, when you weigh this, and granted that's shell weight, so let me kind of get that off out there first. So this, the shell would be, you know, without the interior of this. So if I ripped all this out, I took off all the Velcro on the outside, which, you know, I have plenty of Velcro on this ACH helmet. But if I took all that off and we're just talking shell weight, those are the, those are the measurements there. So those are the weights. Now, loaded out, like you see here, this is about 2.2 pounds, which is still very lightweight. And that's with the Peltors on here, with the, um, with the pads, with the helmet strap, all that stuff. 2.2 pounds, which is pretty damn good. So it really, it really almost feels like you're wearing nothing on your head. <laughs> I, I hesitate saying that because it sounds goofy, but it really does. I wore this around quite a bit since I've got it. I mean, we've had it now only a day, so I really haven't had a chance to you know, run around and toss my head into stuff and see how well it protects it or anything like that. Uh, but I'm going purely off of kind of the setup and initial response I've had to this helmet, and it's, it's awesome. So, you know, moving aside from just the weight aspect of the helmet, it, it has many of the common features that you'll typically find on something like a, a you know, a fast bump helmet uh, from OpsCore um, or a, a configured ACH. This is not a configured ACH, obviously. This is just kind of a modified shell. Uh, but you've still got the elastic bungee keepers here for uh, stabilizing a night vision mount. That's what those are for. Um, and I do like the integration of these into this mount for nods uh, versus the style that that fast uses so kind of on this bump helmet these have always just kind of seemed to be a little bit of a pain to me um, I've had problems before kind of getting these out when I need them you know when it's on my head so I find that this system is a little bit better I know that's a small detail but it is nonetheless a detail I wanted to bring up um, but the mount for this um, it's super stable, so it's still got the same you know features to uh, disconnect and connect a mount like that. It's got the lock still, and I, I prefer this Wilcox mount. It's a great mount, highly recommended, but I don't want to get too much into the mount stuff. But I just want to show the functionality is still there when it comes to uh, the other parts of this helmet, just like it is with you know, a fast helmet like I've been running before. But, you know, when we're talking about weight, you know, and I compare, you know, I compare, what is it, 11 ounces to, um, 11 ounces to 25 ounces. Yes, there's a significant weight difference there, but, you know, when you're talking about ballistic protection versus non-ballistic protection, that to me is, is a pretty good trade-off, in my opinion. So, that's, that's kind of the, the shell of this. And then when I got into the comms and I started really messing around with the Peltors and comparing them to the Sordans, I, there, is, there really is no comparison. I don't know why I've been such a holdout on Peltors versus Sordans, but um, they're more comfortable. So that I've got the gel cups in these Sordans and that was an upgrade I made. So you can see the gel cups there and you can see the gel cup difference on the Peltors. It's like double the thickness of a gel cup um, on the two systems, so they're much more comfortable in my opinion. And Peltor has just done some things that just make sense from uh, the perspective of running EarPro in this configuration. So one thing I really like, these are the Comtac 3s is the, the brand of this EarPro. And what I really like is the ability that they've, they've made with the modularity to simply disconnect the microphone from the back of this. So. Right now, the mic's configured to be on my left side, which is how I prefer it. So if I've got a cheek weld, that mic's not interfering with the cheek weld on a firearm. Um, but the way they've got it configured is that you simply disconnect this, pull off the microphone on this side. I think you have to, yeah, it's just a pinch lead. But you, you take this off this side, 
and you can literally plug this into the other side and run the mic off the other side by removing this little um, protective cover here. So I think that's ingenious. I don't know how long that's existed with Peltor. That's the first time I've seen it, but um, I really liked it. And then when it comes to the microphone, just the ability to move around the mic on the, the Peltor is like night and day. So, and I also like that there's a, you know, a pretty easy replaceable windscreen on here versus nothing on the Sordans. Now, you know, Jordan brought up that, you know, when you're sticking your head out the window, you need, <laughs> you need something. You can use an MRE spoon to, to shield it too. But anyway, um, and then some things that just make a lot of sense to me is, is one, the, the cable length. And that doesn't look like a big increased cable length. It's still a NATO drop lead, uh, both on the Peltor and the Sordans. But just that probably eight inch difference is a lot when you're talking about moving your head around um, connected to a push to talk. So typically a push to talk, you know, sits somewhere where you can, you can grab it with your left hand and, you know, push it here to communicate and then let go to receive. But just that little bit does make a huge difference when you're talking about movement. I didn't find that it was enough to, you know, run it opposite side or anything like that, but I would never run it like that. So whatever side my, my dominant hand is my right and that's what I'm gonna shoot with, I'd always run it opposite of that. So the push talk would always be on my left to not interfere with cheek weld or anything like that. So um, I really appreciated the longer length there. And then one of the big things that I liked too is, and I know the Sordans weren't configured out of the box for setting them up like, like I have on this helmet, but you know, you can see on the inside, hopefully you can see, the, the cord that runs between each of the sides of the ear pro right here that goes inside is fairly short, which means that to actually flip them up like they were designed to do on these arc rails, you know, and be able to fold them out of the way on the back and then down to your side, that cord is moving inside of that helmet while you're making that movement. And yes, I suppose you could run it on the outside of the helmet, you know, to maybe get rid of that, that issue. It looks like it might be enough to go over the top of the helmet, but honestly, I really love how long the, the Peltor cord is on the inside of this helmet. So I actually found that I could tuck it behind this, uh, this ba basically the main pad in here, and it's got enough room to where it clears just fine, and it's not going to interfere with it on my head when I flip these back. So that was a huge benefit to me as well. So the way these arc rails work is that they are in kind of an out position and an in position. So meaning that when they're on, you, you basically push that down like this and you snap those down on each side. So that's what actually pushes them towards your head and allows the seal to be there to you know, prevent the, the noise from impacting you. And then you just basically click them up just like that. And that's what allows you to be able to fold them back and, and stuff like that. So I really thought that was, that was a cool system. Um, I think the, the benefits of this are really there. I thought it was a very comfortable helmet too from what I've worn so far. Um, it's just, it fits me really well and I actually, I've always been a huge fan of the OpsCore chin strap system and the adjustment that they built into it. But honestly, I'm really, I've really loved this chin strap for some reason. I don't know if it's the way my chin fits it or what, but um, I think the adjustment on these is a little different, you know, from the ops core. You have to kind of disengage a lock on the side on these and then clip them back in, which I think is a little bit more difficult than the slide system that the ops core has. But when it comes to the actual chin strap, um, I really like this one better. It doesn't interfere like the other one did with me. So um, just to show you that again on the, the ear pro. So basically what you do, Make sure it's out of the way. You click these in just like that. And then, you know, you've got your comms or whatever hooked up. Then you simply click them out. And if this was strapped in, just fold them back like that. So it's very easy. And you can see kind of where this sits, you know, even when it's connected, it's still right here at the correct height where my push to talk would be too. So you see even folded back, I've still got that cordage. If I were to do that same thing with the Opscore helmet. Now granted, when I bought these Sordans, 
I bought the opposite side because I always flip them around so the mics are to the rear, so listening for like range instructions and stuff like that. So when I configured this on this helmet, now my mic's on the wrong side, but you know, it is what it is. But you can see if the mic is up, that NATO, that NATO drop lead is, is up higher. It's still, I don't know, it still might be kind of in a relatively good position there. So I guess I still do have quite a bit of length there, but um, I do like the extra length on the, on the Peltors there too. So hopefully that just kind of gives you an idea of some options. Um, I've never, I haven't really gotten into ballistic helmets as much as I should, uh, considering they really are something that you should consider before buying plates, and I didn't, so that's my bad. Hopefully you guys kind of learn from that too. I had an ACH and I've had it set up before, uh, but I've never just, I've just never found it to be a comfortable helmet to me. You know, I tried upgrading, which is why kind of everything's torn apart right now. So I tried upgrading it to like the Team Wendy liner that they had. Um, I've tried putting an Ops Core um, strap system in it. And it's just never, it's just never really fit me well, especially with comms. And that was the big thing. I wanted a helmet that would run with comms. So... I feel like I've always bought the right size helmet. You know, I always took that into account when I, when I buy helmets. And, you know, the medium is what I'm supposed to be wearing. And it's just, it fits great when there's no ear pro on it. But I think that's why a lot of helmets are starting to have a higher cut too. So, you know, on this, that's something worth mentioning too, is the cut on this helmet is super high. Like even compared to this bump helmet here, it is a higher cut, I think. Yeah. Looks, looks to be a little bit higher cut, maybe not. But um, it is a higher cut, which allows Ear Pro to, to fit in the helmets a lot better. And that's something you know the ACH doesn't have. There are some other helmets that are made out there that are very similar to the ACH, but they have a, you know, a high cut on the side to allow for Ear Pro. So that may be the only thing that is really preventing me from using that on the helmet. But, um, and then to quickly talk about iPro, they have a kind of a 600 series iPro that 3M came out with. It's basically kind of an upgraded version from what I was mentioning on that gear tasting before. So same slim profile when you're talking about the sides. You know, I really like this aspect of it. They're, they're, really, they're really thin on the profile. And actually, they're fairly stylish for sunglasses too. Like even compared to the, the other style, um, I feel like, you know, these are something I could rock at the range and you know, still be on camera in a fashion shoot and be okay. So anyway, um, what I like too that I found out about these, and I didn't know this before, is that these are coated with a, like a water, what is it, water resistant? Uh, yeah, I wanted to say Scotch Guard, but I didn't think that was right. So 3M Scotch Guard is what they're coated with, and they say that that anti-fog, anti-coating, or anti-moisture uh, resistant coating can last for about 25 washes. And I don't really know what a wash is on sunglasses. I suppose maybe wiping them or you know, spraying something on them and cleaning them off because I think eventually it will get off there. Um, but I do want to test that out too with this eyewear and, and find out about that. So I see the hinges are a little upgraded too on these. That's something that kind of stands out to me as well. But um, anyway, these are, just to give you some specs here, they're tested to military velocity impact, uh, 15 caliber, looks like a mil PRF 32432. Um, sun protection, UV exposure, obviously protection from what they're supposed to do, fragments, rock, sand, and dirt. Um, and then fro fogging, it says that water droplets from condensation and fog uh, due to heat and humidity ultimately blocking vision, so it does remove that. So. Anyway, I'm looking forward to kind of getting some more time in these two scent clear and smoke, I guess. So I'm glad that I have clear because I, I usually like wearing clear eye pro even at the range. So um, hopefully that kind of gave you an interesting recap of some stuff, maybe some things that, you know, we can talk about in the future too as I get more time with this stuff. But um, right now I'm re really digging the shell and I hope to get more time with it and report back.
All right, questions over coffee today. Starting with Michael C. from Twitter. Just watched a gear tasting episode. Why don't you like fleece? So it's not inherently that I just have a problem with fleece. I have a problem with fleece when it gets wet. I feel like it doesn't dry as fast as other synthetic fabrics. So, you know, kind of give you an idea. This is the fleece layer level three from the PCU system. So block two, one, I can't remember. I think block one. I think block zero was the first block, but anyway, so this is the fleece from that. I've just found that when it gets wet, it's, it sucks to, to basically, you can walk dry the PCU system. That's the premise behind it. And there shouldn't be any reason why you can't do that. In my opinion though, from what I've used of the, of the fleece layer and other fleece layers out there on the market, um, I do feel like the PCU fleece is a different kind of fleece. I don't know exactly what the number is. Uh, most of them are, uh, come with some kind of polar tech number for the fleece, but this is a, a less dense version of fleece. So it is a lot faster to dry than some of the other fleece on the market for, you know, I guess a, you know, an underlayer or a insulative layer. Um, I happen to like this Arteryx jacket, this is the Atom jacket. Um, I like this for an insulative layer versus fleece because I know, and it's been proven to me just through use that I can get this dry faster than I can this. So if I sweat it out um, for one reason or another, this dries faster for me and I can walk this dryer quicker than I can a fleece layer. So that's why I don't like fleece. Hopefully that kind of gives you a little insight into that because I think I did dog on fleece in a gear tasting episode. So hopefully that'll give you a little context as to the why. Okay, last question I'm gonna go through today is from Douglas D on Facebook. I'm getting ready to build a precision rifle and had a question about your sling choice. In particular, why did you opt for the H cup QD versus one of the other ends? So if you know, if you're kind of familiar with attachment methods for slings, I'm going to talk about the actual piece that goes onto the sling that actually attaches to the gun. So rather than show you those examples, I'm going to show you the sling version examples. So the reason I chose QDs like this is because the actual cup that it goes into or the attachment system that's on the gun is flush. There's nothing sticking off of that versus um, something that you would connect um, an HK sling hook like this into, which is commonly, which I commonly use on my guns. I've showed that before, like on my ARs. Um, in, the, in the rear, I don't have an HK sling hook, but in the front I do to be able to transition from a two to one, two, to two point to a single point. I use an HK sling and I sling it onto a Midwest, Midwest Industries mount that I have up front. The only problem with that is there's kind of a circular protrusion on the, um, on the hand guard that's on the front of the gun. So on that Picatinny rail, I have that little piece that's in the adapter and I have a, you know, it's kind of a half moon shape almost that sticks off the gun. And that's fine on an AR. I feel like ARs already have kind of bulkiness going on. They've got parts sticking off of them and, and whatever. Um, but with a precision rifle, you're trying to sometimes get into very precise shooting positions. And when you have stuff sticking off your gun, it can be a hindrance rather than a help uh, getting into those positions. So I like the flesh cup option because of that. And the flesh cup just basically fits in a QD. So you can imagine what this fits into if you're not familiar with a QD like this, but what that fits into is just a flush mounted screw in insert which I guess you're referring to in your question as the H cup. Uh, but I, I just, I've always called them flesh cups. I'm not sure which is right or wrong. They're probably both right. But anyway, that's what I've used. So when you typically buy a, uh, a hunting rifle or something, it usually comes with a sling swivel stud. And what that looks like is it's almost a little nipple that sticks off the gun and it's got a hole that goes through it. And this is what the, uh, the basically the adapter looks like for that. Uh, the problem with that, is that some of them are push button like this, so it's like a quick disconnect. Some of them have a little screw on them, which makes it a real big pain to get off of there. And while the sling swivel stud is still pretty small, it's probably not anything that's going to affect your shooting, I guess, if it's on there. But my, my issue is that in precision rifle and some of the matches that I've been to, they'll tell you quickly like, hey, no slings at this stage or something like that. And you have to get rid of your sling quickly and take it off. And the QD just is a great option for that because it's very easy to quickly disconnect, 
versus, you know, obviously the name is QD. So when you have a sling swivel stud, that can be more of a pain in the butt to, to get off of because you actually push this button, you rotate this thing down, pull it off, put it back on, you have to push the button. It's, it's just kind of a big pain in the butt, so I've never really liked that. And the HK sling uh, swivel for a precision rifle just never really made a lot of sense to me because I didn't want that protrusion sticking off the gun. So hopefully that answers your question, and thanks for the asking. Thanks for the asking. Thanks for asking. Thanks for asking. Thanks for asking. All right, guys, thanks for watching Gear Tasting. If you have any questions, as always, use the pound tag Gear Tasting on any social media network, and we'll find them and get them answered here on the show. If you like what we're doing here on Gear Tasting and you want to help support our growth into the video realm and audio, which we have some lofty goals, and we go through all those on Patreon. So check us out at patreon.com slash ITS Tactical. The link will also be down in the description for the show as well. Thanks for watching.